Thank you very much. Uh, I see we already have the picture up. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we are happy to share our um, look at 3D printing um, from space. Um, but first, we're just going to show you a few uh, projects. Uh, we are around five, 600 people now working with offices in five uh, countries. We have employees from all over the world giving inspiration to our projects. We work on all scales, from the larger master plan, even a plan for, the, for our own planet Earth, down to the very small scales, uh, like lamps and watches and so forth. Um, here are some of the projects that we completed over the year. Uh, and we have a number of projects under construction currently uh, uh, that will soon uh, be finalized. It more or less all started in, uh, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, where we built the V&M house, and next to that, the mountain, that was this sort of experiment in uh, housing typologies. Um, then we moved to, uh, to the US, to New York City, uh, where we made the court scraper, sort of a hybrid between a European courtyard building and a high rise. Uh, and lately, we are about to complete the new Google headquarters in Mountain View, California. That is this big uh, open tent structures where the Googlers uh, will work uh, and be able to change their working environment very quickly because the, you don't have any columns or walls to hinder uh, these uh, configurations. We also completed a small museum in Norway, outside Norway, in Kistefusk, uh, that doubles as a pedestrian bridge uh, and as a sculpture itself, you could say. In Copenhagen, we completed a little uh, panda residence, a yin-yang sign seen from, uh, from the sky. And uh, also last year, we completed the Copen Hill, this uh, artificial ski slope on top of a uh, waste to energy power plant. We've been working uh, quite uh, a lot with space, and we have had a strategy um, that sort of emerged uh, seven to eight uh, years ago uh, that is all sort of condensed into this book that we call The Architect's Guide to the Galaxy. This is a book that is a help to architects around the world um, that want to design architecture for space. Here they can learn about all the different uh, parameters, the pressure, um, the gravity, uh, radiation and so forth, and then use this manual as a guide to designing their own uh, architecture. Um, so it comes with a sort of a lo lot of explanations that an architect would need uh, about pressures and gravities, uh, earth angles and so forth. Uh, so quite a, a good and handy tool for future space architects. Um, here you see a little example of, of course, uh, the conditions are very different depending on where on planet Earth or where you are in space. Uh, down here is a zero gravity, maybe up where on the moon where you have very little gravity, you can jump a full story. Uh, and uh, as you see on Earth, we need a staircase to do that. So it, it changes the way we make architecture. Five years ago, we got the commission to design a Mars science city uh, outside Dubai in a desert. And here, scientists from all over the world would come and share knowledge uh, and do their science, uh, building uh, a sort of uh, urban uh, farming, vertical farming, uh, but also sharing the knowledge um, about how to live in space. For us as architects, we have to understand what it means to design in space, and we call this Martian vernacular. On Earth, there are many types of vernacular architecture that takes its form from its surroundings. So in the Arctic, you would build igloos because there's a lot of ice. Uh, other places, it's so hot that you have to dig down underground to keep it cool. Um, and then you dig caves underground and so forth. In the same way on Mars, because there is no atmosphere, uh, or very little atmosphere at least, we need to create a small biosphere that contains all the life and the elements we need to survive on this planet. This is a, a gentleman that captured 
uh, these uh, plants in a bottle 60 years ago, and the bottle cap has not been taken off since. The only input that the plants are getting is sunlight from the outside. Otherwise, you have a perfect enclosed biosphere here. On Mars, it becomes a much more complex system that you would need to capture in your uh, biodome, essentially. So on Mars, uh, when you go there, you have nothing other than Martian sand. But you can take this sand and you can put it through a regolith uh, plant so you can get some water ice out. This water ice you can turn into water. You can also further filter uh, the stones and turn it into fine sand um, that you can turn into bricks. You can create Martian concrete from this or even ceramics. Uh, these, this fine sand, there's a lot of minerals in here, iron oxide, aluminium and so forth. So we can make products like bottles and the glass. Um, but we can also make electronics, so we can essentially produce computers and other equipment on the, on the surface of Mars, and we can produce photovoltaic. Photovoltaic we can use to get our energy that we need, and through, um, um, through electrolysis we can take the water and turn it into oxygen and hydrogen together with the Martian atmosphere and hydrogen uh, through what's called a CPT uh, reactor, uh, we can get methane. And methane and oxygen is a very good rocket fuel that uh, Elon Musk is going to use for his rockets so that we can get back to planet Earth again. We can use um, the, the, these kind of chemical processes um, to to get carbon monoxide and together with the iron oxide we create steel um, and further chemical reactions creates hard and soft plastics so that we can create materials like fiberglass, bottles, furniture, insulations, the softer plastics are textiles, uh, rope uh, and so forth. Everything we create on the planet will of course be used and recycled into a closed loop system. And perhaps the most important ingredient that we are uh, creating on the surface is uh, transparent membranes so we can create our biosphere, our closed uh, domes. The water, of course, can be used to grow plants um, and all of this water will be treated in root zone uh, cleaning systems uh, on the planet. We can even use the water to create uh, swimming pools and so forth. Uh, but of course, most importantly, we would uh, create um, hydroponics, aeroponics, and so forth, so that we have food uh, for humans, so we can sustain life on the planet. So all in all, Mars looks very dry, but you actually have all the ingredients that you need to build, or to sustain life, but also to build a community and a cities um, of the future. When we build architecture uh, on Mars, we have to create enclosures. Enclosures are good to keep the air inside, but it has some drawdowns. If a meteor hits or radiation uh, emits on you, um, that doesn't protect you enough. So you also need to 3D print some structures in here um, that would further protect you, but you also need to dig down underground. Um, you need to go down seven meters under the the soil to be fully protected for the radi radiation on the ground. So in, as a principle, you could say that you have to merge these three kind of typologies into one. And that became kind of the basis for our Mars uh, Science City. Uh, this creates a protection uh, on the outside. Uh, you are allowed to go outside for a couple of hours every day. But uh, at night time, for example, you would sleep underground where you have full protection. This would evolve into a small city of domes that would intersect and create protection in case one of these domes would uh, deflate. So in Dubai, here we would build this first prototype, an image of what a Martian city could look like with 3D printed structures. Uh, narrow corridors inside because this protects you very well for the radiation that comes from the entire 
uh, sky, but here it only comes uh, directly from above, so it's limited quite a lot. But we also found out that water is a very good absorbent for radiation. The hydrogen molecules absorbs and you only need one meter of water. So you could imagine having windows to the outside uh, full of water uh, and fish. Above, you would have a lush garden. Plants do not care about uh, radiation. So you're here you would be able to wander around with oxygen uh, for, for hours every uh, day. So th this is, of course, our vision for the Martian city. And throughout the process, uh, many people have been asking us, why do we want to look into the, to space? Uh, this is because a lot of the adv advancements that was made uh, from the Apollo program, things like LASIK, insulation, uh, firefighting equipment, uh, fil air filtration systems, water filtration systems. What I mentioned here all comes from the innovations that was created during the Apollo program. Of course, bringing and creating an entire city on, moon, on the moon and on Mars will create equal amounts of uh, technological advancements that we can use here on Earth. If you look at sort of the, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goal, eight of them are directly impacted by the challenges that we are facing by going uh, to Mars. So in many ways, by looking at Mars, trying to tackle all these things, we solve some of the challenges that we face here on our own Earth. This is an image of Earth taken from the Curiosity rover from the surface of Mars. This is from the Apollo mission, looking back at Earth, um, where the, the astronauts, when they returned, and, and maybe Andreas can, can, is concurring with this conclusion, is that when you go into space, you see this little blue dot, or this blue uh, marble uh, in space, and you understand how precious that is and why we need to uh, take good care of it. Following this, pro uh, this project, we've been invited to, uh, by NASA to look at uh, or help them design the future base for the Artemis uh, program. Just like the Martian project, there's uh, many factors playing into account here uh, that we need to take into account. For, uh, and one of maybe the most important thing is that when you build a house on another planet, it's very costly to get the building materials up there. Um, so uh, one kilo of cement is very cheap on Earth, but on, on the moon, uh, it would be very, very expensive. So we need to understand how to use the materials available on the surface. The surface. We need to 3D print uh, our structures because we only need to fly up the robot, and then the robot essentially does the rest. We need to create protection from the radiation and the environment, and we need to deal with the big pressure differences between inside and outside. When you 3D print, uh, you have limitations in kind of the, the shape of the building, but when you get to a certain size, it doesn't make sense to print bigger domes anymore. So the toruses or the donuts are very clever shapes. So here, with the limits of the 3D printing, we would print the shelf of the habitat, and put soil on the outside to protect for meteors. Uh, this would also protect for the heat uh, or the cold outside to the inside, and the radiation gives us some limitations of the thickness of those walls. We can create these small shelves on the structure to keep the soil there so that we don't need to print as much. And then on the inside, we would uh, spray on a layer that would keep the air, air inside the, the habitat. The pressure uh, deforms the object itself, and this creates this optimal shape that we're using for our building. And here's a section of the habitat uh, on the moon. Um, uh, Tauruses are not the, uh, is, has been studied before uh, by NASA. Here you see the, the habitat uh, from the sky consisting of these uh, structural ribs that you see through the building, creating these shelf structures that you would put your soil into. Uh, here seen from the outside, and when we take a step inside, 
Of course, you'll see a very high ceiling, but because you can jump very high on the moon, it makes perfect sense that they are designed in such a way so that you can reach the higher shelves. There's one window facing Earth, um, and here seeing uh, from the outside, and astronauts look uh, at the place. And as a final small uh, uh, view, uh, we are currently designing uh, the, the crew and health performance exploration analog habitat in Houston, Texas with NASA and ICON um, that are printing uh, this habitat, which essentially is this uh, sort of large uh, living place for astronauts where they're going to spend a year and there's going to be three crews, uh, crews, so for three years in a row, where uh, NASA will learn a lot about what it means to be isolated inside a habitat, a, s a small uh, plan of the place itself. And uh, if we have time, there's a small one-minute video. We don't have time, unfortunately. We then we say I'm uh, sorry. Thank <laughs> but, uh, but thank you very much. Is there a place where you can tell people they can go and see more about this project if they want to see the video or, or other uh, things? This is uh, all online. So, so, uh, so we can, we, so you, you can, can check uh, it out. Google is your friend. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.